advise control blast in one minute. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! It was a busy year. Uh, 2004 and 2005 was a busy year in Iraq for us as an infantry company on the ground. And so we just felt really fortunate. We wanted to keep that, that tie there, keep that bond. They came together as a unit on the deserts of Iraq, but they stayed together as a unit thanks to a game whose roots go back to the days of the Celtic warriors. Something with that resonated with us being soldiers. Just, and it, it made it easier kind of to hook guys into coming and trying it out. It was kind of a gut check, you know, you say, this is a warrior sport. Are you a warrior or not? Go, Larry, go! Go, go! It became the unlikely story of how a group of soldiers from one unit in the National Guard changed uniforms, picked up their new weapons, and brought a bit of Ireland to Concord, New Hampshire. Nobody else plays it. So, um, you know, pretty much any of us on the team can at any point say we're among the 10 best hurlers you know, in New Hampshire, and we're not lying. Respect those guys that are going overseas by kicking some serious ass on Saturday. Wolves! Low there at Commons, two formed parties stand. Each grasps the bended weapon in his hand. Then near each other in the ground are fixed, two sticks at each end, some score yards betwixt through one of which the wooden ball must run before the game is either lost or won. And now the ball flies swift across the ground. Now o'er their heads, behold it lightly bound, anon it falls. The ready heroes near oft intercept it in its quick career. Concord, New Hampshire is home to Charlie Company, third of the 172nd Mountain Infantry of the New Hampshire National Guard. As the crow flies, it is literally thousands of miles away from the rolling and preternaturally green fields of Ireland. But for one group of soldiers, that distance has faded to zero, thanks to the most remote of locations and the most unusual of sports. The main thing that we're doing here in Iraq is making sure that we keep America safe. Charlie Company's job is to secure the main supply routes so we can ensure freedom of movement for all convoys and military and civilian personnel. They came from all over their home state to serve. Their mission was focused but varied, from convoy escort. OK, they've been hitting convoys. I don't think they'll be hitting us, but if they do, they'll have a surprise. We, uh, we know how to respond to those very well. To sniper missions and IED clearance. Well, throughout the year, uh, Charlie Company has received 12 Purple Hearts, of which nine, nine guys were returned to duty. They were okay, uh, you know, slight wounds, and were able to go right back to work. Uh, three of the folks actually had to be evacuated, you know, back to the States so that they could heal up and get better. And all of them are doing fine. You know, everyone's, everyone's getting back in shape and just take a little bit of time. On the whole, this company has performed far above any expectations I think that any of us had. And the way that the guys came together to get all these missions done has really been spectacular. And the company was named the best company in the battalion out of eight companies by the past battalion commander. And that includes active duty and guard reserve. And it's because of what these guys did every day. And just to watch them accomplish what they've accomplished throughout the year has really been amazing. For me, it's been very rewarding to be able to see the work that the company's done and what all these guys have accomplished throughout the year out there. And you really see it with the local people. And just to be able to be a part of that with this group of guys has been great for me. When their tour of duty was over in 2005, they left the battlefield and stopped once again to refuel before the last leg home. Good morning. Good morning. Have a good day. It was then that their company commander saw something he had never seen before. About a year later, we came back out of Iraq uh, through Shannon, Ireland again. Same place, two in the morning refueling stop, and uh, happened to see a little bit of a hurling match on a TV screen there by the bar. And, you know, it was a bunch of us said, well, what is that? What is that sport? Come on, boys, get it right. 
But keep going, no boys, till you get it right. That sport was hurling. What wasn't clear was how the national sport of Ireland was going to make a difference to a group of soldiers in New Hampshire. All right, boys, let's go. Bring it in. Except for you, Lori, take your time. <laughs> and at first, I assumed it was a big joke. And it's a bit of a practical joker, so I assumed I was going to get out there with a stick and get some pictures taken of me and, you know, it was going to wind up in some paper or something, looking silly. You know, that's why they're so good in Ireland, because it's like average is 60 degrees over there. When Charlie Company, 3rd of the 172nd Mountain Infantry, returned to New Hampshire from their deployment to Iraq in 2005, it didn't take long for life to return to business as usual. For First Sergeant Lore Ford, that meant his position as the senior NCO in the 237th Military Police Company. For Warrant Officer Luke Kolodish, it was returning to his job in public affairs. And for then Captain, now Colonel, Ray Vallis, it meant returning to life as the International Affairs Officer for New Hampshire. It was a National Guard deployment. When you come back, guys go to the four winds. Uh, people go all over the place. And so it was kind of the last time that we were all together, but in that isolated environment um, of being just a unit together. We need something that's like a, a central point for the guys that deployed together, like sort of, sort of a rallying point, something that guys could participate in or uh, get together without being a once a year reunion or something like that that you know maybe it's hit or miss or just a group of guys going out to a bar or something like that we wanted something a little more tangible but we also wanted an outlet that was healthy something that was physical um, you know something positive and something that even if you weren't physically playing you could still support the team in other ways originated about 2,000 years ago, they think, based on archaeological evidence. And uh, the way the sport started was as a, a way for Celtic chieftains to train their warriors. And they would play a hurling match for days long. And they would swing the hurley, which is the stick, uh, shaped somewhat like a, a war club or an axe. And it was training for warriors for battle. And that's the origin of the sport. So something with that resonated with us being soldiers. Just, and it, it made it easier kind of to hook guys into coming and trying it out. It was kind of the gut check. You know, you say, this is a warrior sport. Are you a warrior or not? You know, and then they have to come out and at least try it. Same idea. The first man takes off, right? Picks up the ball at the first cone, right? Out to this cone, right? Turn. Back into the hand. All right. You know, it was something that, that uh, Colonel Vallis wanted to, to do and, and Sergeant Clements wanted to do to kind of keep the unit together. Uh, you know, something, that, in, especially in the National Guard, everybody sort of drifts apart and, you know, once you're back from deployment. So he wanted something to, to bring them together to, you know, keep active, to keep doing things, to keep their, their social lives active as well. Um, so they saw hurling and uh, on their way over you know, back from, our, our, from uh, Ireland. And, uh, and so he, he, he and I have known each other for a little bit, and um, he kept trying to, to get me to do it. And at first, I assumed it was a big joke, and it's a bit of a practical joker, so I assumed I was going to get out there with a stick and get some pictures taken of me, and, you know, it was going to wind up in some paper or something, looking silly. Send it back, no, Larry. Come on. Hurling yeah, basically awesome. started for me when we got back. Uh, back. That's it. Colonel Vallis had said, "Hey, uh, we're gonna we're gonna start a hurling team," and I was like, "Okay, great, let's do it." You know, I had no idea what it was, didn't really care. Uh, he was he was our commander while we were there, and uh, I was his driver, so 
whatever he wanted to do, you know what I mean? He was a great guy, so I, I would have done pretty much anything that he asked. Uh, you know, if he said, hey, let's go start whatever, it didn't matter, you know, I was going to do it. He was just um, always, always a great guy. Nice pass. That's it, Eddie. Into the hand. Come on. That's it, boys. Every time. Because the first time you show up, it's so awkward, it's so foreign, that I didn't, like, I didn't immediately love it when I started it. Uh, I think the first two practices I came and I, all I did was practice flicking the ball and trying to get into my hand and then throw it up and hit it. I don't even think I made solid connection with a slitter until probably like my third practice. Ooh. Oh, yes. That would be the one. The basics of hurling is you have a ball called a slitter that's about the size of a baseball with raised seams. You have a, the stick which is called a hurley. And the job is to put the slitter through the uprights above the crossbar for one point or under the crossbar past the goalie for three points, which is called a goal. You can raise the ball off the ground with the stick. You can kick the ball to propel it forward. You just can't throw it. Nice and easy now, boys. Out to the halfway line again. Put it in now, boys. Last one. Game on Saturday. All right. We all started off on equal footing, and that was the thing. If we had started an ice hockey team, say, you get half the guys have been playing since they're three years old, some guys have never played, some guys can skate but not play. You get all different levels. With hurling, we were all at square one. Everyone had to learn from the basics, and that created sort of a bond, too, because we're all, hey, we're all in this together, we're all at the same point, and we all have to develop together as, as players in this new sport. So that was part of the lure of selecting hurling to start a team. I think you make a, a big progression quickly in the sport as you start, you know, as a beginner, having never played before, you get some of the basic skills down. And once you do that, you start to um, really enjoy it and like it. And, th and then you suddenly realize you're not that good. And, and then to get to that next level, it takes a lot of work and many years that, you know, I probably, uh, I mean, I'll never get there. And maybe if my kids grow up playing it their whole life, they might start to get there. But I mean, when you see the Irish play, like, and realize how good they are, that, you know, I could practice every day from now, and, and I wouldn't be as good as they are. This could be interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And uh, from the first time, you know, we had practice, it was just, I fell in love with it. It was everything that Americans love. It was high scoring. It was physical. Uh, and it and encompassed a lot of sports that we play. Uh, baseball, football, rugby, soccer. I mean, just it had everything uh, in some aspects. So, you know, I instantly fell in love with it. And uh, I, was, I was good at it. So that helped. Well done, Eddie. Good stuff. Call it beginner's luck, call it timing, call it brotherhood. But the National Guardsman who came to the pitch came to play. And as Ray Vallis predicted, it had the desired effect. You go through certain things, uh, you know, you see certain things, and uh, it just, you develop that bond. Well, when we got back and, and we got on the pitch, that was, that was it. You know, that, that bond really intensified. When you play that hard with guys and, and when you challenge yourself like that and you compete against other teams, like you can't help but you know, develop a bond. Nobody else plays it. So um, you know, pretty much any of us on the team can at any point say we're among the 10 best hurlers you know, in New Hampshire and we're not lying. Saturday is the culmination of our season as a complete team before a bunch of the guys go overseas. All right, make it count. Make it count for that, all right? Respect those guys that are going overseas by kicking some serious ass on Saturday. That's how we do it, all right? That's how we honor those guys going over there in the desert for a year. We show up, we bring it from the throw in till the very last whistle blows all day Saturday, all right? Field set up 8.30, start warming up at 9. First throw in is at 10. Over the years, the bond between these soldiers has grown. And in 2010, they received the ultimate compliment. Well, we said, we need to go to, to where it all started. And our goal was to develop as players, uh, to develop cohesion on the team, uh, to
to develop our respect for the sport too, because this is the national sport of another country. And there's a, you have to have a certain respect there. You know, you can't just Americanize it. You know, you have to really understand where it comes from and the role that it plays in Ireland, because it is significant. It's a very significant part of their history and of national identity. The Barley House Wolves, as they'd come to be known, accepted an invitation from an Irish Army hurling team to experience the roots of the game firsthand. I tell you, it was an emotional experience to play in Ireland uh, against other soldiers from another country. It was an amazing experience. We went to Croke Park, which is the, the main stadium, kind of the heart and soul of the Gaelic Athletic Association, the GAA in Ireland. We took in a county match. Uh, we got to see Cork versus Tipperary, which was a huge match and an important match on the year, and really get an appreciation for how it looks when the sport is played correctly. It was an eye-opener. These soldiers play with a passion often reserved for those who've grown up around the sport. But they play with something else as well. And that part of their game comes from the other side of their lives. When you're out on the pitch, you know, you can't yell out sergeant because you'd have like eight guys turn their head to look for the pass. So, you know, we came to an agreement, you know, rank had to come off when you step on the pitch. Hands up. One, two, three, whoa! A number of soldiers in the New Hampshire National Guard wear two uniforms, but it's by choice. There's the one they wear on duty, and then there's the one they wear when they're on the pitch, where the Irish game of hurling is played. Hurling is not for the faint of heart, but neither is life on the battlefield. There's a connection between the military mindset and what's going on in an athlete's mind in the heat of the game. It's a connection that serves the Barley House Wolves well in a sport like hurling. Honestly, I would say it's, it's one of the most difficult sports that you could take up this late in your life. Um, coming from Ireland, everybody who does play hurling would pick it up at a very young age. So for this bunch of guys, you know, some of them who are over 40, to take up this game, it's amazing, and the commitment that they're showing to it really is, you know, something else. I can't believe how well they take instruction. Um, with the skill level they're at, well, from my, when, when I first started with them, you know, I kind of likened it to training kids, except, you know, when you're training kids, you've got a number of kind of wayward kids who won't do what they're told, but from the minute we start training here, the guys are clued in and it's obviously due to their military background. Come on out, pick up the ball. Put on your hurley, solo around the outside cone, solo back and drop it at that cone again, all right? There's a direct translation between sports teamwork and military teamwork. Everyone has their role to play. Say you're playing a field sport. Everyone has their position. Everyone has their job to do. And it all contributes towards, towards the whole towards the larger picture, the larger mission. So if you're on the field and you're the goalie, you have a specific mission. Your, your job isn't to score goals, it's to prevent them. It's a narrow focus. Um, but everyone has their role that they play, their specific job to do that contributes into the larger success. Being military members of a team sport, one of the things that comes quite a bit more easy when I talk to other uh, guys that are running hurling teams in the area. Uh, the discipline aspect makes our team aspect a lot easier. Um, when we say, hey, line it up for drills, the, there's not a lot of questioning or dragging feet. I mean, guys know what they have to do when they go do it. I'm talking to a, a guy who runs a team up in Maine, and he said, you know, I gotta get guys to start doing drills, you know, they don't want to, and I said, what do you do for that? He said, really, it's not an issue for us. You know, being a military-based team, you say, hey, it's time for drills, the guys know. Time to line up and we'll run through the drills. There's not a lot of questioning it or anything like that. It's the basic discipline to know you have to 
work hard in whatever you're doing in order to get better. When you pass it, you follow through to either the other side, okay? So concentrate on this, boys. Get the hand pass right because we're going to be moving into a race at the next drill and the last two teams are going to get pushed up. You, you know, I, I think I see a lot of that as I, as I watch sports. Um, you know, guys kind of question the coach, or why are we doing this? You know, you see that a lot. And uh, I think for us it's, okay, yeah, we're going to do it. All right, you know better than we do. So even if you don't, okay, you know, it's, that's what we're going to do. Okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it. We're going to get it done. And if it doesn't work for us, we'll take that into account and change things next time, do things differently next time. You need to slow down a bit, dude. Just make sure your pass is right. The discipline may be the same, but there's one distinct difference between life in a military uniform and life in a hurling kit. You're wearing a uniform for both, but there is, there is a difference. Um, but it's one of the things we have to establish when you're out on the pitch. You know, you can't yell out sergeant because you'd have like eight guys turn their head to look for the pass. So, you know, we came to an agreement, you know, rank had to come off when you step on the pitch. Whether it's playing on the pitch or working on base, one characteristic of this unit has carried over from their time in country to their time in Concord. One of the common traits you see with Colonel Vallis is uh, when he was when he took over the company uh, as Captain Vallis, he instilled a sense of pride in the unit. He told the unit that you know basically he said you know you're the best unit in the state, you're the only infantry unit in the state, and you're going to train harder and work harder, but you'll know you're better than any other unit in the state. And you know he carried that through when we were here in New Hampshire and then overseas. You know through four, when we went through a mobilization site, he said you know we're going to be the best unit to go through. You know we're going to you know, complete the task, complete the training exercises better than anyone else has, and we, you know, um, as far as I'm concerned, we did. Uh, and then he continued that attitude of, of just being the best that we could be, and that we were the best. Colonel Vallis just, he taught me a lot as I was a, a young NCO. Um, you know, he taught me different things as we were going through our year in Iraq, and uh, when, it, when we get on the pitch, it's, it's more of the same thing. It's, you know, hey, you need to be working on this. You need to be, you know, trying to put it through the, the uprights at 65 meters. You know, those are the things you need to practice. You want to go in the middle? Good job, boy. Keep tightening it in a little bit. Now. He's got this, this quality about him that when he asks you to do something, uh, he makes you think that it was your idea. It's, uh, it's, an amazing quality that I wish I had, <laughs> but he really will make you think it was your idea by the time he's done talking to you. But it's not just leadership that has helped this group of soldiers transform themselves from guard unit to hurling team. It's that sense of pride for me, you know, knowing that I've helped to bring this to, to a lot of people and uh, that I'm gonna continue to try and do that. You know, it's just that sense of pride. I, I bring that to, to work every day. This is our house, all right? We've never lost in Concord. The club has not lost a match in Concord. We have not. Win that on Saturday. We go out hard, we win. We've been training harder than anyone else, I guarantee it. We've been busting ass, and it'll pay off. All right, hands in. Rolls on three, guys, sign off. One, two, three, rolls! Can't be right in front of me. <laughs>